Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to see you here on this uh, Hippie Modernism Forum. I'm Greg Castillo. Uh, I'm an associate professor of architecture uh, right here at UC Berkeley and the co-curator of Hippie Modernism, the show, which I hope you'll visit uh, afterwards uh, in the gallery where you will see, if you haven't been there already, a lot of examples of fluid identity, all, all kinds of mixing and matching and merging of different kind of cultural identities done during the counterculture era, which is, of course, the topic that we're going to discuss today. Uh, I'm sorry about this little strange event a few blocks from here. I think it's suppressed our attendance just a bit, but uh, we'll proceed along anyway. And I'm uh, very pleased to introduce our moderator, Juana Maria Rodriguez, who's a professor at G in Gender and Women's Studies here uh, at UC Berkeley, and she's also affiliated with Performance Studies a Graduate Group. Uh, other campus affiliations include the Berkeley Center for New Media, the Center for Race and Gender, and the Center for the Su Study of Sexual Cultures. Uh, Juana is the author of two books, Queer Latinidad, Identity Practices, Discursive Spaces, and uh, the uh, author of uh, Sexual Futures, Queer Gestures, and Other Latina Longings. She's published numerous articles related to her research interest in sexuality studies, queer activism in a transnational American context, and critical race theory, as well as technology and media arts. So Juana, please. Again, thank you so much for coming. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce our three fabulous panelists, and then they're each gonna come up, do a little presentation, then we're gonna um, just have a conversation and really open it up to the audience. So um, our first speaker is going to be Lauren Anki, who is uh, chair and dean of the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Humanities Center at Cuyoga Community College in Cleveland. And the idea of a humanities center at a community college, I think, is so important in, in, in this moment. So the, uh, the role of the arts um, is something that uh, hopefully we'll be talking about today. Um, she's also, uh, for seven years, has served as the Vice President of Education and Public Programs at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum, where she developed programs that brought popular music studies to learners of all ages and oversaw the museum's library and archives. Anki is the author of Blackness and Transatlantic Irish Identity, Celtic Soul Brothers, and so we're very happy to have her uh, here with us today. Our next speaker is Fayette Hauser, and uh, an original member of the San Francisco-based Coquettes, a commune, yay for the Coquettes, a commune and theater troupe that performed lavish stage acts in the late 1960s and early 70s at San Francisco's Palace Theater. And um, I showed the film and was teaching Sylvester's fabulous biography. And the students, they just had no idea. They always think that they just invented this stuff. Um, um, so it was really wonderful for them to see the Coquettes. We're so lucky to have Fayette here. Um, her portraits of the Coquettes, which are featured in the hippie modernism, really reveal the group's offstage antics and uh, radical lifestyle. And, you know, at Berkeley, we live for offstage antics and radical lifestyle. Um, she's also designed costumes for Bette Midler, the group Manhattan Transfer, and numerous film projects. Our final presenter is Brontez Purnell, and is a writer, dancer, musician living in Oakland, and uh, produced the influential zine Fag School, um, and performed in several Bay Area queer punk bands. Uh, Brontez has written for various publications, including the online edition of Jigsaw, and has also written a column called She's Over It. I'm never over it. So um, <laughs> for the maximum rock, rock and roll. He is the co-founder of Brontez Purnell Dance Company. And so I'm really excited to have these amazing speakers here today. And uh, let's bring Lauren up and we can get started. Thanks, Juan. I've been joking. I'm like the conventional person on this panel. So like I suddenly feel like 
like the straight man in a comedy routine, right? Um, so we could here. I think we have something coming. Maybe. It's all working. You're messing with me. Here we go. We got it. All right. Um, delighted to be here and really uh, psyched to be here in Berkeley and to get a chance to see this uh, terrific exhibit. I want to thank Greg for um, inviting me and uh, Sean Carson from Bamfa, who helped put all the arrangements together. He was uh, really great. So I want to talk for a, a few minutes here about um, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, no surprise or revelation that we talk about Jimi Hendrix as exemplifying the fluidity that the exhibit is all about, right? Um, but I, I really want to think about um, Hendrix's um, racial status at the time and in memory, especially in rock history. And I was struck yesterday when I went um, through the exhibit, the, the middle uh, outfit that you see there uh, by House Rucker Co. out of Austria uh, called Electric Skin, as I walked past it, I was like, that's like a Jimi Hendrix outfit. I think it's made out of PVC, I guess, but it, it looks very much like his Isle of Wight costume. So when we think um, about the musical and sexual and lifestyle experimentation of the counterculture, it makes perfect sense where that's somebody, a place where somebody like Hendrix could emerge out of. Because Hendrix's story is really not being able to do what he wanted to do in a lot of other um, sites in his career. Um, so I want to talk about that, but also talk about that the ways in which the, I think the genius of Hendrix really couldn't be accounted for um, in some ways couldn't even really be seen through the lenses of either racial authenticity or racial transcendence. And those were the two ways I think that, that Hendrix was most accounted for in his day and, and still in many ways. So you often hear about Jimi Hendrix transcending race. We never saw race. Race was never there. We never saw color. Um, which elides, I think, um, a lot of the racial politics of the time. Remember that a few years ago, I was given a talk at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and we were talking about music in Vietnam, and specifically about um, African-American uh, numbers of troops and casualties and experiences of the war, and we were talking about Hendrix, and there was somebody in the audience getting super agitated, and uh, we ended it with a clip of Hendrix with the band of gypsies doing Machine Gun, and he finally raises his hand and he said, I don't know why you're talking about Jimi Hendrix and race so much. What does Jimi Hendrix have to do with race? And it, and it really sort of exemplified the, the ways in which um, Jimi Hendrix became a kind of guitar hero for white rockers and, and a way for, I think, white audiences to kind of um, be post-racial, right, in, in a word that we use more now. Um, in a way, I would say that, that um, Hendrix ends up with as much of a kind of complicated racial identity in popular music and popular culture as Elvis. Uh, th this drawing that you see on the left was done by Jimi Hendrix when he was 14, about six months or so after he saw Elvis uh, in Seattle uh, perform in 1957. Um, and I just love this picture because, you know, it's a teenager like drawing a fantasy album cover with song titles kind of shooting out of Elvis's head. But it, it's also, I mean, Hendrix kind of wanted what, what Elvis had. Um, you know, sexually exciting and explicit, loud, raucous music, and racially hybrid and complex in, in good and bad ways. And lo and behold, by 1968, people are wondering if he's the black Elvis in the New York Times. Um, I want to juxtapose two events that happened within two weeks of each other in late 1969. Uh, the first is Hendrix's appearance at Woodstock, very famous. Um, of course, he's playing the Star Spangled Banner. He had just broken up the Jimi Hendrix experience that spring. They played their last concerts together, and he was exploring with a lot of new sounds and new players. And uh, he brought into his band the bass player Billy Cox, who he had played with when he was in the Army in the early 1960s. 
Um, and you see on the top left, on the right-hand side, Larry Lee, who he'd also played with in his Army days, and, and put together this kind of hybrid band um, for Woodstock um, with only one white member, I believe. Um, so it's just a very different visual presentation that Hendrix had on the stage. Um, you all probably know it, but it's worth us just hearing for a second, right? But the YouTube clips aren't coming up on the screen here. So we'll stop that. Ian, I might need you to help me out. I'm going to keep going. Um, so Hendrix was the clear star of Woodstock. Um, he was the last performer on the bill, ended up playing early in the morning on the last day. He was paid the most. And he was playing to, if you see any shots of the Woodstock crowd, you know, it's, it's a primarily white audience at Woodstock by a lot, and he's one of the few um, artists of color even on the bill. Um, two weeks later, he performs in Harlem um, at uh, in a, a benefit event for an organization called the United Block Association, a community organization. Um, and it's really one of the first times that he's in front of um, an overwhelmingly black audience. There's no video of this performance. There's a hideous um, piece of audio that, you know, you it could be anything, um, but that's about it. But there are some really terrific photographs uh, that you can see it was an outdoor show um, that, that Hendricks played on a, on a flatbed truck. And um, folks who were there really describe it as um, a, a kind of a quizzical audience who didn't really know kind of what they were going to get with, with Hendrix. He did not have uh, a large following in the African-American community. And famously, lots of friends of his have reflected later that uh, he he uh, was pelted, uh, they th threw eggs at the stage at the very beginning, and then he kind of really focused in and played a great show and really went over um, beautifully with, with the audience. At that same period, he was getting some pressure from the Panthers to get more politically involved, um, and that was something that Hendrix just kept you know, skirting away from, as a lot of musicians do, a lot of artists do, that may not be something that they want to be pinned down to a particular party. But, but those two together, I think, really tell us that at the height of his fame, um, where Hendrix was comfortable and where he wasn't, and the discomfort that it kind of created in him. So I want to see if I can play this next audio clip, or video, I'm sorry. OK. Can we do it then? Got to go to that mode. So as part of this, he played a press conference. See, it's not going to video. You get it? Let me just get it there. You know, ever since like the LP and the film strip in class that advanced manually, <laughs> the, the tech always fails just when you think you got it. Um, Sure. Let's hit end show and everything will fall apart. There we go. So Hendrix did a press conference in Harlem, and he was talking about Woodstock, but also talking about this benefit that he was playing. And he makes this really interesting comment that unless the spirit of Woodstock was sort of spreading into cities um, and more urban communities, it, it really couldn't fulfill the, the promise yeah, the, there. The is under the benefit of UVA, and we hope to do some more gigs for it, you know, some more benefits. As a matter of fact, what we're trying to stress also is like music should be done outside in a sensible type of way, just like they do it anywhere else. And like if they can uh, have more gigs like this in Harlem. You know, you play outside, say for instance, three days. At the fourth day, you play half the day outside, for instance, and maybe the other time in the Apollo, you know, four shows or whatever, you know. Because a lot of kids from the ghetto or whatever you want to call you know, don't have enough money to travel across the country to see these different festivals, what they call festivals. I mean, seven dollars is a lot of money, you know. So, um, I think more groups that are supposed to be considered heavy groups should contribute more to this cause. So even as successful as Hendrix was at Woodstock, there was something really kind of at him about um, where he fit vis-a-vis uh, -vis the African-American community. Um, I want to just hit, um, in the remainder of my time, um, go back in his story, right? So if we think about 69, kind of back to the beginning, and what his pathway 
uh, was to success. And I think the pieces and parts that he pulled together to create the Jimi Hendrix who burst on the scene in June of 67 in Monterey, 50 years ago, um, and to think about kind of what, what lasted and, and how, that, how those pieces and parts um, came together. So Hendrix, before he ever recorded, was playing on the R&B circuit, also known as the Chitlin circuit, um, behind the Isley Brothers. You can see them far left, a great song called Testify. Um, Curtis Knight, he actually did a lot of recording with Curtis Knight, and you see him uh, with the Curtis Knight band in that center photo. Um, so he didn't start playing with his teeth at Monterey or with hippies. He started playing uh, with his teeth on the Chitlin circuit. Um, and on the right, uh, you see him playing with Little Richard. Um, and again, if you think about flamboyant, fluid identities, uh, nobody, nobody does it better than Little Richard. Um, a, uh, a clip, I used to just see photos of those, those days, but a clip has now um, come on the scene of Hendrix with, in that era backing up. He's with the Little Richard band. Now, how do I get back to that thing? Do I have to do full slideshow again? See, it doesn't like that, does it? So this is like a Sam and Dave type duo, but check out Jimmy. Here he is on the left. serious pants, right? Way up high. Way up high. Um, Jimmy didn't wear those pants. But um, so Hendrix was really six, you know, he did a lot of work on that circuit and he picked up a lot from it. He picked up the show. He picked up showbiz and that you had to do stuff to perform, which, you know, kind of began to fall out of fashion in certain rock circles by the time we get into the late 60s. Um, but he found that R&B world really confining artistically. He got bored with matching clothes and kind of, while he loved to move and dance, the idea of doing it in synchronized steps wasn't something that he wanted to do. Um, he, he got excited by what was going on in rock, the stuff that uh, Dylan was doing. He wanted to play longer songs. He wanted to experiment with the guitar. And none of that was really welcome in the R&B world that he was in. Um, so he kind of relocates himself down in Greenwich Village and gets seen there by Chaz Chandler of the Animals, famous story, and ends up in England um, in late 1966 and forms the Jimi Hendrix experience uh, with Noel Redding and Mitch Mitchell. And he gets, um, is an instant hit um, and, and kind of a curiosity in England. And you start to see his great fashion sense really emerging here um, with that, that great look at the military jacket. What's interesting to me about Hendrix's um, emergence in England is that the English always talk about him, uh, he was successful there rather than the US because in England, we didn't see color. In England, we didn't see race. And like, you're reading that going, really? And like everybody on the scene, practically, every white person on the scene will say that um, as, as, as they reflect back on Hendrix. But of course, by the time you get into the mid 60s, um, England had, not only is England a colonial power, to state the obvious, but England had been experiencing um, immigration from its former colonies at that point for like 20 years. And there were riots over it, discrimination in housing, you know, the, the, the presence of black Britain was real and controversial. And when you look at rock history, it's like black Britain is erased. Um, and so people talk about this utopian thing of, of Hendrix in England, but I, I think that what you're seeing is the English are seeing um, Hendrix in some ways as a kind of colonial object 
as an exotic thing brought to them, right? And he's often described in the British press through those terms. Um, famously, the wild man from Borneo. Um, he's described as a Mau Mau, a revolu wild-eyed revolutionary from the Caribbean, right? But we didn't see race, we didn't see color. Um, um, so by the time Hendrix gets to Monterey in 67, um, he's really, he really knows what he's doing. He's been playing professionally for years. Um, he's really mixing a lot of what he took from the R&B world with what's going on in, in psychedelia. But when he plays at Monterey, he doesn't even have a record out in the United States, right? So he, it feels, I think, like a meteor has arrived. Um, and very famously at Monterey, and I'll sort of mess this up one more time. Um, we'll have to go to slideshow mode, right? No, oh, it keeps doing that for me. Ian, I might need you to just stand next to me. Himself, right? Um, at that point, he's a star. Um, that that really makes him a star. Um, I'm just going to do my normal view. Um, but very quickly, those kind of antics that he did on stage, I think, because they were wrapped in uh, a certain marketing package around Hendrix, are seen as a mark of racial inauthenticity. Very famously, Robert Criscow in The Village Voice calls him a psychedelic Uncle Tom in his review of the show. And you see really similar characterizations of Hendrix. From the left, it's that he's selling out. Um, and from the mainstream, it's just that, you know, he's a freak. Um, Hendrix's sexual power and threat are all over the visual imagery of the time. This is very famously the Electric Ladyland cover from the UK version. Uh, it didn't make the American cut. Um, photos like this, um, which were taken and made part of a concert program for the 1969 tour of Jimmy straddling two uh, topless Swedish-looking blondes um, were really typical of how um, Hendrix was marketed. And as counterculture as Hendrix was visually and artistically, he was not an underground artist. Um, he went for and claimed and got the mainstream really um, throughout his career. But here's a review of the East Village Other from the East Village Other. What a drag it was that Hendrix was so penis-oriented that night. The greatest musician in the world really doesn't have to hump his guitar. Um, playing with his teeth is cool, but doing his guitar is a little out of the question and kind of silly. So, you know, I'm thinking about that. Why is it okay for sort of Mick Jagger to kind of play out in that same way, but not Jimi Hendrix, right? There's a kind of, I think, a policing around his identity that is deeply racially coded. It's sort of like African Americans having to black up to, to perform, right? It's like... Mick could do it, Jimmy can't. Um, this is an issue of um, Look Magazine from January of 1969, uh, really an incredible artifact, especially for the cigarette ads and the car ads, um, about um, race in America. And Hendrix is the one um, artist uh, figured here, but it's really there to kind of mock him a little bit. The photograph on the right, you see him hanging out in, in LA at a hotel pool with lots of women surrounding him. And it keeps talking about his teeny bopper audience. And Jimmy's saying, race isn't a problem in my world. Um, and so in that press, he was really kind of a, a main, a, a cartoon character, I think. Um, a couple of other things, I think, as we start to see across um, 69, is Jimmy really trying to deal with this, seeing in, in ways that his image, as creative as it was, um, was putting him into places he didn't want to be. It was turning him into a stereotype. He could not control that. If you read the show that he put on at Monterey, in some ways having roots in the Chitlin circuit, well, that couldn't be seen. Um, people didn't, didn't have a way of, of putting those together. He worked with uh, one of the last poets, 
um, uh, on a track that was never released, Doriella Dufontaine. And I found this ad uh, for The Last Poets um, that appeared with a quote from Hendrix, actually in the ad copy for The Last Poets album. The Last Poets is an expressway to reality. He gets asked about the Panthers a lot in interviews. He's trying to distance himself from violence, but at the same time, he's introducing Voodoo Child from the stage as the Black Panther national anthem. Um, and then uh, in the fall of 69, he moves forward with the Band of Gypsies and um, actually puts together an all African American band featuring Billy Cox on bass, who he'd played with at Woodstock, and then Buddy Miles on drums. Uh, Buddy Miles, who'd come from the Electric Flag and who'd already had a hit with them, Changes. They only played two shows as an actual band, and those become an album, which was to fulfill a long, uh, 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 Lost, long lost um, contractual obligation for Hendrix, but many people feel like the Band of Gypsies is one of the most um, inventive things that Hendrix ever did. You can see Jimmy and uh, Billy Cox on the far right while they were in the army, uh, in an army band. And I think one of the um, really inventive things that you hear in the Band of Gypsies music is the mix of the psychedelic experimentation on the guitar and the pyrotechnics on the guitar with Jimmy's R&B roots, just because, not because Billy and Buddy were black, but because Billy and Buddy played R&B. So you're hearing that R&B kind of clothesline under um, Hendrix's experimentation. So I'm gonna close with that. So can I just leave it all together? A lot of um, folks that Hendrix went on to influence, um, say somebody like Lenny Kravitz and Slash, have really talked about Band of Gypsies as their sort of entry point um, into Hendrix. And I think that's because he's mixing with and playing with a very different kind of beat there than you'd heard him do um, with, with Mitch Mitchell and Noel Redding. Um, I'm not saying that, that Hendrix goes from black to white to black. I'm just saying that to me, his story is somebody who was trying to have a fluid identity in, in a racial dynamic that couldn't see it and wasn't having it. And you see him at the end of his life really navigating that in very interesting ways. And one of the many tragedies about the loss of Hendrix at so young an age is that we didn't, we didn't see where that was gonna go. Um, his impact is, uh, is, was key to Miles Davis's experimentations with rock. Uh, Miles was particularly excited about the Band of Gypsies record and, and has a long legacy in hip hop. I took too much time, but if we have time at the very, very end, I've got some great footage of Jimmy here in Berkeley at the Community Theater uh, in May of 1970, uh, Memorial Day weekend 1970, at the time of the strikes post Kent State um, and the invasion of Cambodia. So if we have a little bit of time at the very end, we might want to fire that up. Thank you. Now we get to the color. So good afternoon. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Greg Castillo, for this fantastic hippie modernism show and for including the cockettes in such a wonderful way. Um, so this is a logo that, that uh, Jet and I made. He was, uh, he was Jalala in the Cockettes, and he and I made this for the film. It was the, uh, like the beginning of the film, but this kind of says it all, because, I mean, if you talk about a prosperity consciousness, we were right there. We were sort of at the end of the prosperity consciousness. Too much was not enough for us. Uh, so we wanted everything, and we wanted it to be beautiful, too. This is me when I first got to San Francisco in 1968. And you see the person who's lying across the floor, that's Gary Cherry. Gary Cherry was like a pan figure and he tripped all over the city. He knew everyone uh, and he brought people together. So he brought myself, Nikki Nichols and Harlow into Scrumbly's house, which became the first Cockett house. Um, this is me a year later. <laughs> So you can see I, I got really liberated. I mean, this, this person here is 
a little Catholic school girl who uh, came out of art school and had a lot going on up here, but it had not really filtered into the body. And that's what I found when I first came to San Francisco was this body consciousness where through psychedelics, everybody had uh, sexual, they were very sexualized. Hate Street uh, was very sexified. And people had a confidence in their sexuality and in their body consciousness through psychedelics and mind expansion. There was so much uh, appreciation of the self and of the self in others too. And people were very individuated. When you talk about fluid identities, people were seeking their greater self. Uh, and I love what you said about, about Hendrix and his fluid because he came right into the arena. Uh, the arena was, was very open and accepting of everyone. We had two African Americans, an American Indian. We had one of everything in the Cockettes. And it was not, race and gender were not the things that people locked onto. They wanted to know what you had to say, what ideas were in your head. Now. Uh, I, from my art education, uh, I knew a lot of art theory, uh, the Dadaists, uh, the Bauhaus, a lot of performance that was done in the 20s and the early part of the 20th century uh, very much interested me and it was, it was what was taught in our, in our classes, that part of art history. So uh, I had a lot of that going on in my head which I brought into the Cockettes. This is a George Méliès film. It's a little fuzzy, <laughs> but you see it's a, it's a very early silent film. George Méliès was a magician, and when he saw the Lumière projections, their films in Paris, he, he said, I can do this in film what I cannot do on the stage. So he created uh, these very early films, like the, the most famous is called The Trip to the Moon, but he created a studio uh, outside of Paris, and he had... The, the way the women were dressed and the way he had the sets moved from side to side and the dimension of the stage, I found very interesting. And it was, that went into the way we approached the stage as well. Uh, this is a hand colored, they didn't have color films, so there was uh, a man called Segundo de Chaumont who hand painted every frame for the, the filmmakers in Paris, and this is one of his. And you see how the surrealism, and it, it has a reality to it, and that attracted me as well, because we were very much into creating our own reality. This is Anna Mae Wong dressed as a, as a man or as a you know, masculine woman or whatever you want to call it. This was very much a part of the, what the group did. We, we didn't want to associate with anything in particular. We didn't want to say we were this, that, or the other thing. We had to mix it up completely. We had to have a lot of it going on. And, and we were very identified with the masculine and the feminine parts in ourselves. When I grew up, uh, you know, I grew up in the late 50s, early 60s, and when you look at films of the 60s, these women, and they're all, oh, the big hair, and, and I couldn't identify with that at all. I thought, if that's a woman, I don't know what I am. <laughs> so um, it was very appealing to me when I, I felt so liberated when I came to San Francisco because it didn't matter, and uh, I could just be me. And it was also this kind of glamour, this kind of overstatement, making everything so beautiful. Uh, this was attractive to us, too. So we were looking at, and in those, you know, we didn't have the computer or Google, for God's sake, so we were haunting the flea markets for old photos, and we would get inspiration going to the public library all the time. Uh, and getting inspiration for the kind of things that we wore, uh, the kind of glamour we wanted. We knew our souls were gorgeous, and we had to put that on display. Uh, this is a, a film called Madam Satan, which was a very large favorite of ours, mainly because they're practically nude with big things on their head. <laughs> <laughs> which is exactly what we <laughs> featured that quite a bit. 
I mean, there were in in the in the kind of um, mind expansion experience that that people went through that I saw in the park. There were sort of three stages of that. The first stage would be everything unnecessary you had to eliminate. So people would just take off their clothes immediately when they got really into their uh, spiritual side. The clothes came off first. And then they would ally with a spiritual experience that resonated with them. So you would see a lot of togas or you would see the Krishna robes and it would be sort of the flowing fabric and the reason their hair and partial nudity. But the third phase, phase was the individuation when people got in touch with their particular type of self. And that's when it really got interesting. And that is pretty much the way the cockettes were because we were very individuated and everyone had a very, very strong personality. And we, we encouraged that too. We didn't, uh, we would support each other's unusualness if you were unique in some way. And that was really the arena of the city too if you had some kind of a unique thing going on, if you were an American Indian or uh, you know, a mix of things, then you were even better. You, know? you were not castigated for that kind of thing. So everyone created their own look. Um, and we loved living together because once we started the group, it was Hibiscus who, this is Hibiscus, now, he was an extremely special person. I mean, we were all artists of one type or another, and that's, he chose us. Uh, we, in, in the Cockett House, the first Cockett House was a Bush and Baker. Uh, it was Scrumbly, ran it. <laughs> Thank God somebody ran it. <laughs> uh, he was a musician. There was, uh, Link was a writer. John Flowers was a painter. I was a painter. Uh, Nikki was a makeup artist. Harlow, she had been in the GTOs. She was very glamorous. And, uh, you know, so he, ch and, and we would all dress together and go together as a pack out at night to Winterland and to uh, the family dog on the Great Highway. And clothes at that point, this was already 1969. So, Wearing your soul on the outside was how you expressed who you were and it was how you attracted people of like mind. The, the, and all these different kinds of things people were experimenting with, ways of dressing um, and mapping, kind of mapping the trajectory of, of your soul vision on your body. And uh, I mean, now they talk about appropriation which I don't think is the proper word for this, for the counterculture, because we were homage to Eastern religion or to uh, native patterns, and it was helping us to discover uh, the journey of our own soul. We were not doing anything for profit, which is what I think appropriation means. You just put something and you gotta make money off of it. But that was not our intention at all. So Hibiscus had been in theater in New York. He was in underground theater. Uh, and I had, I had seen some of this when I was a kid in New York. Um, he had worked with Jack Smith. He had worked with John Vaccaro, Theater of the Ridiculous. So he brought that very avant-garde experimental sensibility with him to San Francisco. Uh, he went into the cauliflower commune, which protected him. Um, but it was, it was very rigid. So he had to break free from that in order to realize his psychedelic version of experimental theater. So he presented himself to our house, came in with a big bunch of flowers and looking like this. And, uh, you know, he was extremely dramatic. He, he was, he came in and like fell to the floor and said, I want to live with you. <laughs> so, uh, please, there was no question. So he moved in. This is uh, the Cockett house, as you can see. It, it, it either went on the body or on the wall or both. Um, so within weeks, he presented his idea of a theater that he said, we need to put our life onto the stage. So we started working on it. 
and he created this album, which is in the show. It's gorgeous, and we all had ideas of things that we wanted to do, things that were particular fantasies of ours, and we would contribute to this beautiful book. It was sacred. We were doing a sacred thing, and we thought this was going to be fantastic. So to, at first, <laughs> Hibiscus found a theater. I don't know if too many people don't know this story. First, he found a theater that was in the Fillmore. It was really ramshackle. It was falling apart, and it was a porno theater run by this man with a, a bald head and a cigar. And um, he had somehow, I don't know what the hell he told him, but the guy said, sure, you can do shows here. I don't care. <laughs> so before we were ready to do our show, we had a very young girl in the Cockett house who was actually, she was 14 years old, but we didn't know that. She told everybody either she was 16, 17, or 18, depending on who she was talking to. Her name was Tina, uh, and she was gorgeous, and she was very sexualized, and she would bring home rock stars. She brought Iggy Pop into the house and Alice Cooper, and so, but she had a boyfriend uh, named Boop, right? So and he was a musician, so he said, oh, Tina and I are getting married. He thought he could corral her, somehow lasso her into better behavior if he married her. So Hibiscus said, I will officiate. <laughs> so we went to the theater, and uh, of course we were naked, and Hibiscus made big wreaths for all of us, and we were... Tina and Booper in the middle, and we're having a ritual, dancing around them naked. And the theater owner happened to drop by, and he came in, and he pitched a fit. He said, get out. They're going to arrest me. I didn't know you were going to have a live sex act. <laughs> so that was the end of the theater. But this was already, by this time, it's December, and Hibiscus was determined to announce the theater uh, at, on New Year's Eve 1970, because this was the new theater for the new decade. So Link knew Sebastian, and Sebastian ran the Nocturnal Dream Show at the Palace Theater, which was the very first midnight movies. It was a Chinese theater, and all the hippies would wait outside, all dressed up, and the little Chinese families would come out, <laughs> and we would go in and take over the theater, and he would show films. He was a cinephile. And he would show films, obscure films, avant-garde films, everything. He was the first to show John Waters on the West Coast. Um, everyone went there. And, uh, it was Friday and Saturday nights. And so Link approached him and said, can we jump on stage and do something on New Year's Eve? Now, Hibiscus's dream was always to call it the Angels of Life Free Theater. But one of the, so we had, different ideas for different acts, small and large, themes for shows, all of these things. And one of the smaller things that we were going to do was uh, a can-can, like the Rockettes, but it was going to be the Cockettes. So we said, well, let's just do that, and it'll just be the, the teaser. It'll just be a little sous for them to know what is in store for them. So we got all dressed up, and Hibiscus brought a little record player and, and a 78 record and put it on the side. I think it was a little kid's record player and he put it on the side of the stage and somebody plugged it in. And so we had this French like that. And we all did our can-can and looking the way we were and the audience went out of their minds and Hibiscus is standing next to me. <laughs> You know, we we had no idea that it was going to do this. So he put it on again, and we did it again. And then they started racing towards the stage. Everyone jumped on. We all took our clothes off. And Sebastian had announced it. You know, Link said, you know, he said, what are you calling it? And Link said, oh, the Cockettes. And so he announced us as the Cockettes. And no one wanted to hear anything else after that. It, so... And Hibiscus was sort of irritated because he wanted it to be called the Angels of Life Free Theater. But however, no one would call us anything else because they loved the, the name. Uh, this is him in his room. Hibiscus was so much fun to be with because he was one of the most abstract people you'll ever meet. You had no idea where the conversation would go. He was about as far from normal as you could get. He was totally joyous as well. He was a divine person. This is Link. He was our writer. 
Uh, this is his room. Everybody's environment was very specific, too. We were constantly on the hunt for the great item. And since psychedelics had put you into a nonlinear time space, uh, you didn't have to care about trend. That was the, the counterculture completely eliminated trend and style. And so things from the past were so beautiful to us, but the mainstream only wanted to whitewash everything. You know, the 60s, it was whitewashed in primary colors, like, you know, my mom. But uh, hippies saw through that, and we appreciated things from the past that were very beautiful, and, and they were nothing. They were, they were practically free. Uh, frequently were free, especially for us. So <laughs> that was one thing about being on stage. Once we started doing these shows, people just gave us things. They just said, oh, well, you must have this. So uh, we were lucky in that way. And uh, we were very, at, Link was also a very abstract-minded person. And so we were into mixing up patterns and styles because we just couldn't have one idea. You didn't just exhibit one idea. You had to have several ideas in a multi-dimensional space. This is Link as Anime Wong. I took this picture. Uh, he, he was also a fabulous person. And we didn't, we weren't trying to be perfect. We were not trying to emulate something in its, in its you know, a, a honed way. Uh, and I absolutely loved the rip and the tear and the wrinkle. I thought to me it added a whole other dimension to things. It was almost as if you were traveling and this was a moment, but yet it was still moving because it didn't really have, the, the outfit didn't have a beginning and an end. You could see the history in the rip of the umbrella. You could see uh, where it had been before because of this, this wrinkle, and it, it just added so much to me. I absolutely loved it. I didn't even, when things were neat and perfect, it made me nervous. And this is also Link. Uh, and you can see he, he was an American Indian. He was a Cherokee. Um, and you can kind of see the way he has the feathers. If, if you see the film Dances with Wolves, they wore the feathers kind of in that splayed way. So. He had a bit of the American Indian going on with him. He was a very special person as well. This is, this is me in uh, Ford Wheeler's house. My friend Billy knows what Ford Wheeler was a collector, and he had an environment that was even more over the top than anybody else. Uh, this is our room. That's my cat. This is, we had to live with as much of it as possible, and it, it inspired us. To me, the mess inspired me. I liked it when all of a sudden you'd turn around and you'd see something together that you had never thought to put with something else. And then it gave you a whole other idea. And, uh, that, and we shared all these ideas, too. This is Wally. He was, he was a lot like Hibiscus in that he would take days to get dressed. And he always had a very large thing on his head. And he would go tripping around the city and come back three days later, and half of it would be gone and the rest would be in shreds. <laughs> he went on to become uh, the, um, I guess you'd call it the stylist or costumes or whatever label, but he worked with Dr. John, and he dressed Dr. John in like this, and even more so. And then he would also leap on stage and dance with Dr. John, loved him. This is sweet Pam, that's in our cockette house, and she's pregnant. No one, you know, those were the days that where you, like, like Lucy with the big bow and a, and a dress like that that hid your pregnancy. Pam was really the first person that I ever saw that actually would show her belly and be pregnant, and you know, now they walk around practically naked with their belly. But, uh, you know. And there were also, there were five women. I mean, the Cockettes were hippie. It was a hippie group to begin with. Yet there was a lot of, you know, there were gay hippies, but the word gay wasn't even in the vernacular at that point. Um, so 
everyone was accepted regardless of where their proclivities lay. So there were five women in the group, and, uh, and we all lived together very happily, too, sharing everything, I might add. So this is the kind of thing, I don't know why it's so blurry. This is the kind of thing that we admired. Hibiscus also brought this in because he loved the Broadway stage. And we were, this was also at the moment when um, uh, the word vintage and the word oldies came in. I remember when I was in high school, everything always moved forward, even in music. My brother was a musician and a record collector. And so we had, he had an enormous amount of 45s. And the, the record that was big the year before, you couldn't play it again. But then all of a sudden, the word oldies came in. And so something that had been popular the year before, you could still listen to it and play it at the dances because it was still considered great. And it opened up a whole avenue. Uh, in film, the film Casablanca did that. It was the first film that became really popular that had been made, you know, uh, 20 years ago or whatever. Um, and everyone loved it. So people started showing, there were theaters in New York, there was the Thalia, uh, the Bleecker Street Cinema that would show old films. And so, I mean, even before when I was still in New York, I used to go see silent films, French New Wave films, old Broadway musicals. So these were very popular at that time. Uh, and so we were all informed about this, and I loved, Pam and I both loved these Corrine outfits, like this. I mean, I was just mad for this. So we started, okay, so it's, it's New Year's Eve, 69, 70. So a few months later, I think we had done one, maybe two shows. We did one every month. We would put together the shows. And then there was a pivotal moment, certainly in fashion, and it was the MGM sale. Uh, MGM opened their wardrobe department and put it up for sale. The famous things like the ruby slippers and uh, you know Scarlett O'Hara's green dress, they went up for auction. Uh, and some of the high-end stuff went for sales in, in Los Angeles, and, and they opened up really high end. The very first, I mean, the word vintage wasn't in the vernacular either, uh, but stores started opening up to, to sell these clothes because Edith Head <laughs> was at the head, you know, and it was quality, quality stuff, and this is what it looked like. So someone bought all the chorus girls, all the extras, all the stuff that didn't go to auction came to San Francisco in a big warehouse. And the Cockettes were invited to come there. And there, there's uh, Ed Shea, who, who was like a beatnik photographer. He took pictures, too. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that we found on the racks in this sale. So then not only did we have the fantasy of being a Corrine, we had the actual drag. <laughs> I can't tell you what a thrill it was. Then there was no stopping us then. Uh, we used to go to that place every day. And uh, you know, so our shows really took a big leap at that point. This is something from the MGM sale that I still have. I still have it all, doll. Um, now, who knows what little film that was in. Some of the things had tags, and you'd see, like, B-movie actors tags in the, in, the, in the clothes, and beads, and the, the beads that I have with the grass skirt outfit, that came from MGM. They were, like, and the colors of things and the size of things. This is another thing that really fascinated me was uh, they would have the details were oversized because it was film. Like so, you would have an armband. I have this armband that has these giant pearls on it, and if in real life you would have something like that with tiny little pearls, but this one had big pearls. So it was this proportionate uh, element in fashion that I became fascinated with. Um, just the oversized situation. So this is all MGM. This this picture. And this is John Rothermill. Now, John Rothermill was a very fancy dresser, and he would find the most glamorous outfits. And we also started shaving our eyebrows at the behest of Nicky Nichols, who said we have to have more canvas to paint. 
So everyone uh, shaved their eyebrows. I looked awful with shaved eyebrows. So some of these things that I'm wearing, the sleeves, the beads, MGM, all MGM. That's a total MGM outfit. I mean, really, can you imagine? And that's a showgirl outfit from MGM. That's Daniel Ware. This is an actual showgirl. I mean, this is the kind of thing that inspired us, especially the gay members of the group wanted it to be bigger and more fabulous. And we were very much into the, the screen stars from the 30s, Marlena Dietrich, because she was a very fluid identity. <laughs> You can say that. And there she is in uh, Blonde Venus. And this is my version. This was my Dietrich phase when I wanted to be very high glam. And that's John Rothermill. Uh, so we had no problem with the male or female thing. Uh, it, was, it was not at all a problem. We just uh, went anywhere with it. This is Scrumbly with his fabulous 40s jackets. People were not really wearing those things. I mean, I think Greg and I were talking about it, and I mean, it meant a lot to us, but I think in the larger sense of the word, I think it really altered fashion because people started wearing these uh, big shoulders. It certainly influenced fashion in the 80s uh, with Terry Mugler and Claude Montana went into the, the 40s with the huge shoulders. So I think it was even more of a pivotal moment than I had realized before. This is Reggie. He's an African-American. He was a dancer in LA. He was uh, with uh, the Frank Zappa group. And he and Dusty Dawn came to San Francisco and, and became a part of the group. And that's another one of close up of me. This is Harlow. Harlow was like a little gammon. She looked like one of those little 20s drawings where the, the feet come to a little point. That was Harlow. Everyone loved her. Ask Peter Coyote about Harlow, and he'll tell you, darling. He will tell you how much he loved her. She was very popular. <laughs> this is Marshall, and he, he's wearing my skirt. Uh, the, okay, this picture is in this show, and also there's a picture of me in the show, and we're both wearing the same skirt. This was the Palace Theater where we performed. Now, it took over a year. We performed for about three years, and it took over a year for them to put cockettes on the, on the uh, marquee. And it, it appeared in the Chronicle and Herb Cain's column. He was the first one to, to bust it out into print because nobody wanted to print the word cockettes. Um, but he put it in, he talked about the cockettes all the time. And so once it appeared in the Chronicle, then um, Mr. Chu, who owned the theater, who was forever like, <laughs> he said, okay, and he put it on the, on the marquee. Uh, this is an early show that we did called Fairy Tale Extravaganza, and you see that Sylvester in a very flowing outfit. Uh, Reggie had been a friend of Sylvester's in Los Angeles, and Sylvester, was an incredible singer, um, and he had been in, in the gospel groups. He grew up in uh, South Central. Um, Central Avenue, his aunties were jazz babies, and so uh, he wanted a, a career, but he also wanted to be Billie Holiday. So Reggie said, I know exactly <laughs> where to bring you. So he came, we were rehearsing something. I mean, well, rehearsing, you know. We were at the theater playing is what we were doing. Um, before a show, and Reggie brought him into the theater, and he came up on stage, and he opened his mouth, and everybody was floored, because he could sing, he had talent. And so he became the chanteuse, and there would be a moment when he would come on stage, and he would be dressed as Billie Holiday in, in a beautiful outfit with a, a gardenia in his hair, and we also had Peter Minton, who was a fantastic pianist, who went on to become a big band leader. Uh, and Usually, the crowd that came to the palace were everyone in San Francisco. It was the entire street scene, all dressed up, and hooting and carrying on, throwing joints from the balcony. It was a free-for-all. But when Sylvester came on, this hush came over the theater, because they knew, here it comes. And so he would put out the most magic of all. You would think that you were back 
in some club and Billie Holiday was singing. Oh, she went over. That's not fair. Okay. Okay, so these are more of our shows. These are, uh, that's hibiscus there. Let's see. This is also our shows. You can see where we're heading with these uh, outfits. And there, that's, you know, <laughs> we would have to show that. We pushed the envelope even in the city. This is Trisha's wedding. This is Goldie Glitters, was the biggest drag queen of them all. And uh, this is Trisha's wedding, the, the film that Sebastian made, which is one of the funniest movies ever. That's also Goldie. Uh, this was, we performed at Sonoma State. And you see how nudity, no one cared about people being nude. It was such a common sight that it actually became boring to people because uh, they just saw it everywhere. It was in the park. You know, this was a show that we did in Ross Alley. We wanted authenticity. We wanted, we wanted to be in that alternate time zone. So when we were putting together Pearls Over Shanghai, we went to Ross Alley, which is like this little alley in Chinatown where they make fortune cookies. And we just set up in the street, mingled with the people. But Chinese are very, uh, they love street theater. So they just circled around and watched us and, oh, very much, thank you. So we felt like we were back in Shanghai in 1937, which was the theme of the show. This is Daniel and John Rothermill. I'll just kind of go through these. This is Wally with so much drag. And here I am with my pink bells and uh, backstage. This is we, I'm almost done. We brought back Pearls Over Shanghai, uh, the producer of the Howl Festival, which is the Lower East Side Arts Festival in New York in 2008, uh, asked me, I was in New York and I met her at a dinner party and she said, I'd love to have the cockettes. And at that point people, the, the youth were so into our look at that time. I, I mean, th this is how many years later, but yet our look was so far forward that it didn't filter into the population until the year 2000. And when the film came out, the fashion industry completely leaped on it. Um, that's one of our flyers. This is Stephen Mizell did this photo shoot uh, that was an homage to the Cockettes. That's a John Galliano show that was an homage to the Cockettes. So our look, finally, <laughs> after all that time, uh, you know, surrealism in fashion, mixing it up, um, using you know a, a timeless attitude towards fashion started to to come up, and so people would ask me, "Oh, let's have some cockettes," and I would think, "Well, we'd have to call heaven for that because uh, not all around." But we, uh, Rumi and I, put together uh, Pearls Over Shanghai. I wanted to bring back Pearls Over Shanghai for years because it's such a great show, and so we brought it to New York to the Howl Festival, and that. That other picture is Rumi and I uh, in 2008. And then it, it played here uh, at the Hypnodrome for about a year and a half. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. So Jimmy Plays Berkeley, uh, the, f the film came out in 73, but the concert was, like I said, Memorial Day of 70. Uh, there was apparently some controversy because it very quickly sold out and there were folks trying to get into the theater any old way. But this is him introducing Machine Gun um, and you see some footage also from the streets of Berkeley. What? Oh, uh, sound. He'll be back by the time we, right? <laughs> Well, it seemed like a good idea. <laughs> All right. Who knows? Uh, hey, so my computer crashed the other night, so I'm not going to show anything. Like, um, so we're just going to talk through this, right? 
Um, they were talking about like fluid identities. I like first I was confused as to why I was here. Um, <laughs> Cause I don't know, I'm a bit youngish or something like, but then I thought about it and it's kind of true. Like um, I moved here, I'm from Alabama originally. I grew up in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, moved out here around 2001 or something. And it kind of occurred to me that I was amongst the last generation of kids who moved here to play rock and roll. They, they're all ravers now. You know, <laughs> I don't know anybody that like um, plays rock and roll. I like ran up the stairs, so I'm a little winded. My name is Brontes Purnell, first and foremost. Um, I, I'm a rocker here. I write. Um, I have three books coming out. Or I have two books that have come out, one that's forthcoming. I wrote an article called Amplified Feels for SF Weekly, um, written for Maximum Rock and Roll. I started a dance company here, um, a punk rock dance company called Brontes Purnell Dance Company. Um, it actually started when I was guest curating over at the old BAM. Um, and I'm a filmmaker, and I'll talk about some films um, I did. Um, <sighs> So I'll start by saying that um, growing up in Alabama, I always wanted to come to the Bay Area because do y'all know Eli's Mile High, the club? Okay, so my grandmother's brother is the one who inherited that club after Eli got killed. Um, and so he would come back to Alabama and like teach me guitar and like that's pretty much how I started like picking up guitar. And then one day years later, I'm reading on his Wikipedia page that like he worked at Galaxy Records and he worked alongside Creedence Clearwater Revival and like Etta James and Big Mama Thornton. But like he didn't tell me any of this shit growing up, right? Like he would come back to Alabama. And he had like this crazy white hippie girlfriend, right? Like this redhead and she was like always playing harmonica and they like, just like Southern, like Southern black people, like still kind of like conservative, right? And my uncle would like show up and like, they look like total like sleaze bags. And I meant that like in a good way, you know? It, like it wasn't, I wasn't connecting it, but like I was his only nephew who could play guitar out of something like 20 something nephews that he had, right? And so, and plus they knew I was gay. Like they totally knew I was gay. So like they would latch on to me and they'd be like, you, you need to come to Oakland. You just, you need to come to California. You can just get out there. And I'm just like, I'm 12. Like, I can't just like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so after, after that, like, I became like a punk rocker. I was like into all like the Bay Area bands. Like, I read Maximum Rock and Roll religiously, this 30 year old, um, like, punk music magazine from here. And so my friend called me up one day and I was like living with this weird hippie boyfriend who I didn't like, or he didn't like me rather, let's be honest. Um, and he was like, oh, hey, I'm moving to Oakland like in three days with my brother. Like, do you want to like move to like California? And keep in mind, I had never been to California. The farthest west I had been was Arkansas. But I was just like, fuck it, yeah, like let's get out of here. Like, and so I got to his house and he had this van where the speedometer didn't work. We didn't have a license plate or a registration. And I was just like, fuck, like, if the cops stop us and we look like the type of people cops would stop, but again, like that's our whole life that's impounded. Like, I don't want them to take my guitar, but I don't know, we just felt like there was no choice. And then like I remember we crashed. Um, like 30 minutes outside of Mobile and like we were like standing on the side of the highway like I was like in Daisy Dukes and shit and he was wearing like a belt like we looked like girls and these crazy rednecks stopped and we thought that they were gonna flash but then they were really nice you know because you know southerners are nice also and um, then after that we made it <sighs> so um, yeah uh, just in terms of like fluid I did I came here and like I joined a couple of queer bands the first one was Veronica Lip Gloss and the Evil Eyes. I was a go-go boy. Um, and it was, yeah, it was right at 2000. And I, it, it's funny that the the Cockettes, like, it was featured so prominently right there because um, the kids I was hanging out with were art school kids. And they were, like, totally, like, that style had, like, really come back, right? I'm glad um, Fayette left because I can say this. Like, we would get really coked up. And have you ever played that game, Would You Rather Be a Factory Kid or a Cockette? <laughs> like, 
You know what I'm saying? And I'm sorry. I, like, love the cockheads, but I'd rather be a factory kid because, like, you get your own movie. You don't have to share it. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm just, <laughs> I just feel like I'm Edie Sedgwick. Like, when I look in the mirror, all I see is Edie Sedgwick. Like, anyway, um, that was shady. Oh, that was shady. God. No, but it was, it was awesome. Like, I was, this is the first time I went up the coast. It was me and 10 other, like, gay kids, like, in a van. And, like, the lead singer, um, Rainy, Rainy Ramirez, like, we were in Vancouver, and she just, like, pulls her tampon out and just starts painting her face with menstrual blood. And she's like, Brontes, do you think I'm weird? And I was like, no, like, this is fun. She eventually did this really crazy psychedelic movie. I wish I, I actually, it's still, like, it's before, like, all this, it's right before, like, I, I could download it, I guess, but I don't want to watch it because, anyway, it's this movie she did, did a bunch of acid and made this movie where, like, I'm this magical prince and, like, I get fucked by this unicorn. Like, I was totally getting fucked by a unicorn. Yeah, that's pretty, that's hippie. That's, that's psychedelic, right? Okay, that's, that's why I said that. Um, yeah, so <laughs> when I get to the bay... I'm moving into this warehouse that was run by a guy who used to roadie for Green, Green Day. 22 kids in a warehouse, like 22. And it wasn't, I don't remember it being, it wasn't groovy, it was like methy. But like, <laughs> no psychedelics there, like meth. Like, but I didn't know that, like, cause I was just like, I was like, oh man, everyone's up all the time. Like, yeah, this is cool, like, um, but yeah, from there, like that's when, yeah, um, I joined Gravy Train, um, queer, queer electro band. We toured across, we toured across America, and then all the stuff. Like when I was here, like I joined Gay Shame. I started going to Act Up meetings. Like, I don't know, shit was really groovy. Like it was at the Crash dot com. Kids were still getting rooms in the Mission for like five hundred bucks. You know what I mean? Because I remember, like these days, I don't feel like there's like this rush of 20 year olds like as you know sometimes I feel like maybe we were like the last like herd of 20 year olds who could like be here and you know be sleazy and I don't I just don't see it the same way um from there um yeah gravy train was awesome like I, I got to be fucking naked all across America and Europe like fucking, <laughs> you know like when you're like now I'm just kind of like I'll just, like, be reasonable. Like, I've gained some weight and my hair is gray, so it's, like, I can't get away with as much. Like, people, like, question it. No, seriously, like, if I was, like, in a jock strap in a bar in Nebraska dancing around now, like, the cops would get called. You know what I mean? Like, whereas when I was 22, like, people were just like, yeah. Um, there's a video of that. Um, but then also from there, I started The Younger Lovers. Um, this, it's a band that I played all the instruments in. Um, I want to skip that over because honestly, like I play rock and roll because of like my family ties, but like garage rock, I fucking hate it. Talk about fluid identities. Be like a gay black dude playing like rock and roll, right? Especially garage rock where it's like a bunch of white boys from Boston being like, yeah, I'm really into Bo Diddley. Meanwhile, like they're getting booked at all these shows and shit. Like my uncle was like, blues royalty here, you know what I'm saying, I was taught by a good one, and then, like, they won't even, like, book me for the fest, like, it's like, fuck y'all, see y'all in hell, I owe you white boys nothing, um, I had to get that off my chest, and thank you for, um, listening to that, anyway, I'm gonna cut this short, <laughs> um, from there, that's when I started, um, making, uh, movies. Um, I made a written of couple of screen plays. There's actually there's this porn company that's right here called Naked Sword, and they started doing like an indie division. So I do like the indie porn movies or whatever. I basically had this script that I had and I couldn't get it funded. And they were just like, well, if you just put some dick sucking in it, we'll fund it. And so they did. I did. Um, that's really groovy. But so I'm just not working in porn. The last thing I'll say is I'm currently doing this documentary about this guy from here named Ed Mock. Um, Ed Mock was an experimental dancer um, um, from like, he started in 1968 here and up until his death of AIDS in 1986. And so what's funny too is like, I don't know, like 
they always talk about like like the cockheads, but there's so many artists that were like adjacent in that period. And so we're going through the profiles and I'm just like looking at things of him from the sixties and he taught at like the ACT theater and him just doing like these kind of crazy experimental like weird test and he he had a whole drag persona um situation going on that didn't quite i don't know if he i'm sure he came across those people or like i'm sure they were all hanging out oh my god Ed's here why don't i just fucking ask her right oh i'll be like do you know ed mock um so <laughs> um it's been really exciting um just talking about well the main thing in, in talking about like identities or whatever is I'm doing this documentary, it's been two years worth of work, and I'm talking to all these artists from like, you know, like the 60s on. It's been really hard because a bunch of like artists from the Bay in their 70s, it's like herding cats. Like, it's like, it's like, it's really interesting just because there's so much history there. But at the core of it, what I've learned is when they're talking about their lives, it is the spit mirror image of like everything that like, me and my friends went through when we first moved here. They're like, oh, we lived communally. Oh, like, we had to share shit. Like, oh, like, we, when rent started going up, like, what the fuck do we do? You know what I mean? Um, it's been really interesting to see, like, how much history repeats itself. But the only thing I'm worried about is I don't really see that energy necessarily replenishing right now we're in a period of non-replenishing so the work is going to cover that thank you very much Or can you hear me? Yes. So we have about 30 minutes for Q&A, and we're going to wait for the lovely Fayette. We need one person out there. I'm going to stand, because that's what I do. Um, and I want to um, I want to see if, OK, I'll sit down. So uh, as the moderator, I get to sort of start. Um, by asking our amazing panelists. And I gotta say, I love the variety of style, of affect, of look. It's all, it's, it's, it's what we do. Um, so, yes, it's all happening. So, um, my first question to start is actually sort of where you're ending, uh, Brontes, in terms of how, what is the role of, um, of art and creativity and um, in terms of politics, not necessarily in terms of a party or a, a particular kind of act, but when I see the, the memes on uh, Twitter, when I see the kind of creativity in terms of what, um, Art in a time of where you know, as we're waiting for the nuclear holocaust to happen, uh, yes, kind of. Um, people are thinking creatively. So my, I think my first question is, what does, what do we do um, to, to entertain ourselves, uh, to leave a kind of glowing uh, presence? in the, this particular political moment. Yeah. I have been drinking a lot and staying in bed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how, I, yeah, because like, everyone's just like, because yeah, there is that, that thing of like, where people say, well, in times like this, like the art gets like really great. And I'm like, nah, man, like we're bummed. And like, sometimes I'm like, shit sucks and it's gonna suck, like we continue anyway, despite, but like, the, I don't know, like the idea of like, oh, like if I just like make this record before the nuclear holocaust, like I'll totally like zen out. It's just like, nah, I'm like way more pessimistic. Yeah. <laughs> I think what's missing, what, what we had in the counterculture was this sense of exploration, uh, this sense of finding things out and, uh, recreating visions. I mean, and that definitely has been usurped by the profit motive. I mean, uh, what kids don't have time 
uh, which is a very sad thing. Mm. Um, and I, th I think that the young generation should really, it's a very good thing that this is the 50th anniversary of the counterculture at this moment. I mean, it's a bizarre uh, confluence of, of energies, it really is. And I think that having these exhibitions is really important because young people need to know that there is a different way to live. They don't have to. I mean, that was our whole thing was we were not going to work for the man. You know, <laughs> that was like a big phrase. Um, and I think that kids have to know that they can put that aside, that uh, having to really overconsume, uh, overtech their lives, uh, doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. So, and, and I think at this pinnacle <laughs> that we, some kind of pinnacle that we've reached with this embarrassing uh, head of state uh, is going to push people into thinking about an alternative way of life because there's no more just floating along, mm -hmm. you know, which was uh, what was happening, I think, before. I think Obama held the line, and people thought it was going to always be that way. It was just going to be the, the, that was life, and that you know we were cool here. But it's not so cool here anymore. And so now I think young people are going to have to rethink it, hmm. which I don't think is a bad thing. Hmm. That is, hmm. if we don't blow up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to share a mic. Oh, okay. um, y you know that anniversary opportunity is pretty cool to think about. And I was thinking about when you were talking about fashion and being kind of out of time and the counterculture and pulling things from a lot of different eras, or what you were saying about you know kids going through different cycles, say in the Bay Area, right? And com coming through at very different eras and feeling like they were the first to ever do this. I think, you know, how do we pick up from the past to blow up the now is is possible. I, you know, musically, I think the cool thing is that so much of the past is available to us, you know, in a way that, you know, I mean, when I got interested in Hendrix when I was 11 or 12, I couldn't hear his roots I couldn't explore as easily now as I jumping around YouTube and things like that and that excites me about the use of the past but also like right we've been at worse moments or as bad moments I mean so not thinking like oh my god this is no one's ever experienced in America as bad as this and it's like really because no. yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, I think maybe the past is helpful to us but it, it's terrifying the other thing that, um, as your comment makes me think about, you know, when we think about fluidity and movement, um, this, uh, you know, people come to the Bay Area, and but you know, you're from Alabama. I dated a girl. I, I dated a Bama girl, and um, what happens, like how things move in, and then how they go back. And so, even for people involved with the coquettes, you know, some people might have been able to, you know, cut their hair and, you know, go back to some kind of n normative life in. Um, Ohio or Kansas, um, and maybe you still go back to Alabama. So I guess I'm curious about these movements, not just into centers like the Bay Area, but um, movements back out to other places that might not, um, you know, resonate the same way. I know there were these like. Um, this uh, lesbian of color land in Arkansas, right? And so these women must be like 70 now. Uh, but I'm kind of curious about these other places on the map that we don't necessarily associate with the counterculture. Um, it's funny that you would say that because my, step, my stepfather um, grew up in Arkansas and the woman who raised him, she actually came out to the Bay, to Richmond in the 40s mm -hmm. to work in the shipyard. Um, she like worked on like ships or whatever, made enough money to go back to Arkansas and buy a house, the house that he was raised in. Um, my, my uncle was, he actually, he was in the Air Force and that's how he got to California. Um, and he played music like in the Air Force or whatever and lived in Fresno for a little bit. Um, but he stayed, I mean, he stayed out here until he died, you know. But then also as I was coming into Oakland as a Southerner, a Southerner coming to the Bay, like sitting on the dock of the Bay, left my home in Georgia, <laughs> headed for the Frisco Bay. Okay. Um, 
the I was reading these headlines that said like twenty five percent of the black population has actually left um left right. the bay and went back south right. actually where they had roots. Right. So I do think there is like kind of like this constant like rubber banding of I don't know. Well, it, on the on the Hendrix story, I think because he was in the mainstream, right? I mean, he sold a lot of records. He, you know, was was people bought his records and toured in some really crappy places. I mean, uh, no offense to those crappy places, but not places where that would have been a hotbed of the counterculture. I think there's also a way in which um, uh, one of the creative, really positive things about Hendrix's story is what, what was he able to spread? Um, just how did, was he able to expand minds on those shows in really square places where there might not have been much of a scene, but sort of going out and touring that? What, what does that bring and, and sprinkle around. Hmm. Well, I, I have to say that that's the story of most musicians. Uh, and I know that the Ramones played in very small places. They played even in high school auditoriums. Uh, I mean, really, really small places in towns you've never heard of, which is one of the reasons why punk became so big, mm -hmm. was because they did spread it around. So I think that's part of the genius of uh, rock and roll is is that it has spread all kinds of different messages around. Well, but there's one thing I just wanted to say. I was on Hate Street yesterday, and there's so many people that are hanging out on Hate Street that are, th it's almost like a, a performance art. These, these kids that are performing like they're hippies or something. And it puzzles me because they're they're not kind of doing what we did. Um, hippies, there's, of course, hippies were demonized. The whole movement was demonized and trivialized by the right wing, so that socialism wouldn't come to be, and we would, you know, be capitalist. But uh, there, there's an essence of the of the counterculture. Uh, that was very busy. I mean, everybody was really creating stuff because the psychedelics gave you so much energy. You had to do something. And so a lot of artistry was born out of that. Mm -hmm. Certainly the wearable art movement was mm -hmm. born out of that. Mm -hmm. um, you, you just had to do. Some people were either drawing or they were making music. The guitars, they were all over the place and they were in the park. Whereas now I don't see that. I don't see people really doing their own kind of self-creative uh, self-expression mm. in, in a really innovative way. Mm. You know, I, I don't see that evident. Mm. Well, I want to now open it up to the audience. And we have oh, wonderful people that will run around with uh, mics and bring your questions up and loud to our audience. So, um, who, yes, we have two questions over here, yeah. I wanted to ask this question, um, how do you resist in a time when the left has kind of become as bad as the right in that there, there's this kind of fixed embrace of figures like MLK, um, you know, at the end of his life, he wasn't espousing the message that we like to see him espouse and um, rightfully so, and you know, this is like this fixed, um, almost like we're gonna have diversity at any cost, and then we're gonna be kind of be blinded to anything that doesn't fit with that message. I mean, I'm, I'm a curator, I've worked with a lot of curators, and we go to great lengths to present this image of diversity, but because we can't deal with it, or the individual curators can't really deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> How, I mean, for me, the left has become like as bad as the right. You know, like. Well, it depends on what level you're talking about. Uh, I think that uh, politically, absolutely, because they're they're really engaged in hanging on to the money, and and they're just as profit motivated as the right, which is really what's bringing this country down. But. I still see, I mean, I, I'm in touch with a lot of people. I mean, I hand pick who gets in my Facebook page and all that kind of stuff. And I only let 
the radicals in, really. And there's a lot of them, and they're all over the place. Uh, and they're very young, they're all ages, but there's a lot of young ones. And um, also yesterday on Haight Street, I met these teenage kids in high school and I started talking to them and uh, they went crazy over what I was telling them. They want me to come talk in their high school. So, I mean, I think the, the young kids, people that are being born now, they have minds are open. And it's up to us at this point, I feel it's up to the, the elders and the, we had elders. We had the beat poets, we had the writers. Uh, when I was in Boston, um, we had great teachers there. Howard Zinn was in Boston when I was there. Timothy Leary was doing experiments at Harvard. I mean, it's up to us now to be able to fill it up, fill up those little minds and push them in a direction that's going to, uh, evolve this country and not create more, you know, descent into madness. So, it's our job. We also have a question over there. Yeah. Oh, okay. We'll take this one first and then we'll come back. Yes. Hi there. I'm wondering if somebody would be willing to say something about uh, sort of the cultural bridge from like what the cockettes were doing and then like, uh, the uh, punk cultural movement that kind of came out of that or followed that up? Uh, the counterculture really goes from the beats all the way to the punks because it was really the same impetus. And a lot of the artists that were, uh, you take David Johansson, mm -hmm. for example. The right, the New York Dolls came right out of the Cockettes tradition uh, and he still performs. So uh, I think it's all of a piece. Um, people try to segment it as this happened and that happened, but it was all one, it, it was all one movement that really only ended because um, I remember in the mid 80s, I was living in Los Angeles and, and there were fantastic artists. Photography was huge, I was doing photography. There was a lot of people and the punk movement and performance art was was vibrant, and but people were doing it in a fine arts capacity. That's what you're talking about: is whether or not you're doing it in a fine arts capacity, or whether you're doing it commercially. And um, the, I know the entertainment industry and the advertising industry started offering huge money that had never been seen before to these artists to sell product. Uh, that's the difference. When I was in art school, there was a commercial art course that you took, like as a major, and then, or, or you were in the fine arts department. And commercial art, it was not the same. And now, a lot of people, they think it's the same thing. They think I made this fabulous video, even though I'm selling Pepsi, but the video was fabulous. You know, no, you're selling a product, it diminishes the impact and the idea because you're under the thumb of, of uh, a company. So uh, that I think has to be made more clear to people now that there's a big difference. And uh, one has a certain result and the other has a forward movement. And in Europe, they know the difference. And art in Europe right now is vibrant and there, it's, it's overtaking us. I mean, art in America is on a downward spiral. And it's, it's also funded differently. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'll sorry. say, yeah. <laughs> uh, I like hate going to Europe and then I'll have like some European anarchist talking shit to me in his like government subsidized like apartment <laughs> and his school was free. And I'm like, have you ever gotten in a tour van and gone across America? Like, they're like, here's a dead dog, make it work. Uh, <laughs> it's just kind of, it's insane to me. Um, they may not. You know, they, they may be comfortable in their situation, but they are allowed to do art for art's sake. And we're in this country, it's practically impossible. That's all I'm saying. No, no, I don't disagree. No, I, I believe you. I've lived it. Like, yeah. um, and it's kind of weird that you would say that too. Like, um, I, being punk or whatever, and again, like, like fourth generation punk rocker, but also, I don't know, growing up in rural Alabama, I don't think the people in New York ever had intentioned me to be the inheritance, but we always were taught that like punk 
um, was a refusal of a lot of hippie values of like, and I know first, I mean, I just talked to my friends like Jennifer Blowdryer, who was like at the Mubuhe Gardens here, and she's just like, yeah, like my older brothers and sisters were hippies, but that's why we cut our hair. That's why we didn't wear a patchouli. That's why. Well, you're talking about specifics <laughs> there, but the. <laughs> So you didn't like the style, Patchouli, yeah. so fucking what? <laughs> now I'm talking about a level of commitment to your art. I'm talking about being authentic. There not being a separation between the self and the art. And that's the difference now. And that's the movement that ended. It has nothing to do with whether you're not you cut your damn hair. Punks and hippies are totally different, Faye. Come on, girl. <laughs> Come on, girl. Sorry, they're not. <laughs> You've never been sorry a day in your life. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this going? is it. This is it, lovely. Thank we you. have some more questions. Oh, yes, yes. So I kind of um, missed the hippie train um, by a few years, and so um, I always had a very romanticized idea, but not quite understanding what they were. And we came out here to San Francisco in 1980, looking for it in the hate, and really felt like it's over. We can't find it. Um, but when I saw the Cockettes movie, I just had to watch it like three times straight because your energy was so, your vitality is so palpable and that's kind of spiritual force behind it. And I haven't heard anyone talk about the spiritual side and mostly I'm asking how, because um, I assumed that all the hippies kind of sold out or you know, moved up somewhere and got old, but y you haven't. So how do people maintain that spirit over the changing, radically changing times we live in? Well, one of the things that was uh, a reason, I think why the movement lost power was because of this individuation. Uh, a lot of people went to Eastern religion, people moved to the country, uh, you know, earth movement, um, back to nature, the organic farm movement. So it wasn't as collectively powerful because people disseminated, they went all over the world. There were hippie destination points all, all over the globe. Uh, they would go to India, the beach at Goa was filled with hippies. Um, so they sort of carried the message in a way uh, to various places, but politically, a lot of people gave up on politics too. Like the I don't vote and that's a powerful position became very popular. And I know a lot of people, uh, personally, I didn't know anybody who voted until Clinton was going to be the president. And that's when people voted for the first time in like 20 years or something. And I know still a lot of people that don't vote. It's the stupidest thing in the world. Um, so in certain ways, the, the, the intelligentsia or the, the uh, more, the, the higher energy people sort of gave it up. You know what I mean? In, in a group way. Uh, and I, I think in a lot of ways we're paying for that now. You know, we sort of gave it over to the right wing, really, um, which is a sad fact. But that's how it is. I think we saw some other, yes. So are there um, places you can recommend in the here and now in the Bay Area uh, that are holding space for this kind of messy Vaudevere identity? Society are my favorite group. And every year they put that, the steampunk movement really is, is totally in the pipeline with the counterculture. And they're very committed artistically. One more and time, Vaudevere? Vaudevere Society. Vaudevere is the French phrase for uh, street performers and it's where uh, vaudeville, the, the word vaudeville came out of that. It's the, like the genesis of that, that uh, theater. Um, and they're called the Vaudevere Society. And they put on the Edwardian Ball every year. But now they have, they're just erecting a, an enormous tent. It's in Oakland at the Naval Base. And for the next few months, they're going to be doing shows there. So look them up. They're fantastic. I mean, it really, it'll, it'll fill you up. <laughs> it'll the definitely, Edwardian yeah. Ball's not cheap. <laughs> You'll love it. I, um, where do I hang out? 
Actually, Eli's Mile High just got bought by my friend and who's re- renovated it and trying to um, make it like a historic site since, I don't know, it's been there since like the 60s or whatever. Um, he kept a lot of the posters. Um, there's this place called The Lab that I've partnered with to do the documentary about Ed Mock. Um, they have kind of... They have kind of situations. I don't know, but I'm also like, I just feel like it's like changed to like uh, living in West Oakland um, almost 10 years. I remember when we first like moved in, we had this warehouse and there was some newspaper article that was just like, there are 17 underground venues in West Oakland. And like, yeah, we used to roll out on a Friday night, like to a bunch of Molly, like go to five different parties. And like now, like there's totally no place to party. Like there's like all the... Yeah, all the warehouses are kind of gone. But um, if you're ever really bored, you can just come to my house and we'll play Uno. <laughs> we have a question up there. I love a lively audience. This is great. Well, this conversation's reminded me of this crazy uh, series from David Milch that I watched called John from Cincinnati. And um, it, it was... I didn't get it. <laughs> but then at the end of the D- DVD extras, David Mills sits down and talks about what's what his view was on this. And he's like, you know, soulless mercantilism is the organizing principle of our society. And, and accepting that can be salvation in itself. Art can, tra- can transcend that. And people are just afraid. And so if you can bring a commercial premise to things, it's it's like... It's a very interesting thing he's saying versus, you know, uh, you've got to be authentic in your art and that's over there and we're over here. It's a very different kind of thing. So I'm not articulating it very well, but it's, it's, if you can ever catch it, it's, you know, plays into this conversation very nicely. Great. Um. Wait, like I should commercialize? <laughs> no, I'm down to sell out, just no one's buying. <laughs> you know what another word for selling out is? Getting paid. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There has yeah. got to be uh, some kind of a combination because, well, my feeling is that we need the, the American Fine Arts Union, which the British have just created. It was made legal four days before the Brexit vote. God bless those artists. They have the British Fine Arts Union, so there's a standard the fine arts is at the bottom of the barrel at this point. Uh, salaries for people who do things are at the top. Um, a lot of, there's like people who head museums, they make half a million a year, do they really need that? Uh, and the artists get nothing. It's, it's a dilemma right now and people don't understand. The, it's, the, it's the art market right now. It's all about the art market. And they don't support the young upcoming artist as much as it should be supported. Um, like what you're talking about in Europe. I mean, they they understand where it comes from, but in this country, it's, it's really a dilemma. And I've talked to a lot of museum people about it and they all agree. Um, but it's something that needs to be addressed. There's a balance there somewhere, but w- uh, we ain't got it now, that's for sure. Well, we have... That's right. All of us. All of us. So that's right. Uh, Gentrification. Um, So we have to get out of this theater very soon. I am going to wrap this up. I'm going to ask each one of you to uh, tell our audience one thing to go see or taste or do or try. First. Sure. Um, <laughs> from the past, future, present. Right. From come to Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, come to Cleveland, Ohio. See what people are trying to do with um, former industrial sprawl that has shrunken. Oh. Um, it's everybody in in the Bay Area would know him, I'm sure, but uh, Kamazi Washington just dropped a new track called "The Truth." Uh, Thursday or Friday. Uh, great, great uh, jazz sax player, and I haven't been able to shut it off since I heard it, the truth. Fantastic. Well, I just told you. Okay. <laughs> Bought a beer society, the tent in Oakland, the big top. It's called Tortona, and the show is called The Soiled Dove. Fantastic. 
Um, I want everyone to try to watch my documentary. Um, it's called um, Unstoppable Feet, The Dances of Ed Mock. And it's about the life of Ed Mock, an amazing artist from here. And I'm going to give you one more thing. Okay. My band is playing tomorrow at Starline Social Club. It's the $5 Locals Only show. Um, come rock with us. Buy me a shot. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all very, very much. Thanks, our amazing audience. And uh, thank you to Banff. I hope you're all enjoying this beautiful new space we have.